It sounds so simple, but I do think that there is merit in trusting your inner voice, um, even if you have to hold it within yourself for survival for a certain amount of time. I think that is, it is important to own that voice. From the ACLU, this is At Liberty. I'm Kendall Seesmeyer, your host. On January 21st, 2017, a day after the election of former President Donald Trump, activist and journalist Raquel Willis approached the podium at the inaugural National Women's March in Washington, D.C., to share her story with hundreds of thousands of attendees. A sea of pink hats and vibrant protest signs flooded the National Mall in what became one of the largest single-day marches in U.S. history. With this momentous platform, Raquel was determined to galvanize the crowd to support liberation for all women, namely Black trans women like herself. Give it up for Raquel Willis! Black women, women of color, queer women, trans women, disabled women, Muslim women, and so many others are still asking many of y'all Ain't I a woman? So as we commit to build this movement of resistance and liberation, no one can be an afterthought anymore. Hold each other in love and accountability. Not even three minutes in, after calling out the erasure of trailblazing women of color from feminist history, Raquel's microphone was cut off. Unfortunately, the silencing was something that Raquel knew all too well through her work in supposedly progressive movements and newsrooms. This experience only fueled her fire to make intersectionality the baseline of all liberatory efforts. Raquel has made waves in her work as the former executive editor of Out Magazine and national organizer for the Transgender Law Center, demonstrating her dedication to uplifting the voices of trans people of color. In her new memoir, The Risk It Takes to Bloom, On Life and Liberation, her voice takes center stage. The book explores Raquel's history and journey with identity, education, grief, community, and remembrance. Her recount honors not only her past and present, but that of the trans community worldwide. Today, Raquel joins us to shed light on her story and vision for the future of liberation. Raquel, welcome to At Liberty, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. You're very worthy of it all. That is all things that you have done. (laughs) (laughs) That's so impressive. So impressive. So first, I just want to say congrats on publishing your memoir. This is so exciting. Thank you. You've dedicated so much of your career to telling stories, particularly those of trans people of color. And now through your book, you're letting the world in on so much of your own story. What inspired you to write The Risk It Takes to Bloom and to move from personal essays to a full-fledged memoir? In 2020, that was when I really started the work in earnest. I'd been laid off from Out Magazine, which I chronicle in the book, but I had a lot of time on my hands, as you can imagine. And so Mm -hmm. I really was interested in kind of retracing my steps um, into my social justice work and and this kind of lens that sees storytelling as one of the greatest kind of organizing opportunities ever. And I think with that, it was necessary for me to also tell my story of just coming into my identity. And so, you know, you, you kind of get a twofer in this book of, which is why the subtitle is On Life and Liberation, um, because you get kind of the early parts of my life, and then you also get kind of my journey to to building an idea of what collective liberation could look like. Yeah. I mean, you you cover so much in the book. And and to that end, I think 
when you begin the book in the introduction, you take readers specifically to the the podium moments before your speech at the 2017 Women's March in D.C., which, you know, just to remind people, Trump had just been elected. It was a heavily emotional time. And obviously your personal story doesn't start here, but you do choose to start the memoir here. And I'm wondering why. Well, honestly, that was such an important moment in my social justice journey, just because it really was the first like high profile platforming experience I had in my career as a national um, organizer for Transgender Law Center at that time. Mm -hmm. And I will say that wasn't always the start. Um, And that was one of the first essays that I wrote because it kind of takes a chunk from an essay that's in the middle of the book that goes into deeper detail. And I think it also serves as an entry point for people to really kind of put themselves in your shoes. I think we all can remember the scenes that we saw, whether we were there or not there. Then you quickly kind of flip back into your early upbringing. The chapters of your book describe your Southern Catholic upbringing in Augusta, Georgia. You write at length about the role that of faith as a as a pillar for your family and and also write about how some religious ideas competed with or were at odds with your identity. Can you talk a little bit about how growing up in a religious home impacted you and your early awareness of your queer and trans identity? Yeah, well, I like to level set and kind of give people an idea of how Catholic my parents were. Yeah. So we sat in the front pew pretty much every Sunday. My parents would always, you know, shake the hand of the priest, sometimes engage in, you know, long, drawn-out conversations with the priest at the end of Mass. Um, My parents were Sunday school teachers. And then the last thing is my mom was so involved in church that she received an award from our bishop for her service. So, (laughs) I mean, we were about as devout as it it gets, right? And so with that, I think the early feelings I had was that I wanted to be clued into what everyone else was kind of feeling around religion because I just was not feeling it. I was like, ain't nobody Mm -hmm. talking back to me. You know, when I pray, I don't hear anything. And then I speak about this in the book, but there was one kind of key prayer that I had at different points in my childhood. And that was this prayer that I would just wake up as a girl or wake up as normal. Mm. And because God never answered that impossible prayer, as I talk about it in the book, that kind of bifurcated my world. And so I had this kind of interior world where I was processing all of these things, trying to like strategize how I could survive in this environment. And then this external world where there were all of these expectations Mm -hmm. that I was not meeting beyond religion, you know? So thinking about masculinity, um, straightness and heterosexuality, all of these different things. Did you at that time have a lot of messages that were being given to you about sexuality, about identity, and were they scornful? What was that experience like? I mean, the image that I received, I believe, is the image that most of us receive. You know, it's this idea that, like, there's a script. Mm. And the script is, you know, if you're born with certain genitalia, you're supposed to be this way, right? Mm -hmm. And I just knew from a young age, partly because my peers saw my difference, whether it was Mm -hmm. them calling me a sissy or a feminine or just like a girl or gay— that I was different. I was Mm. never afraid of my truth. The fear was just what the reaction would be from everyone else. Now, my parents, I can't say that my parents were homophobic or transphobic. They just didn't talk about queerness, right? Like, queer people didn't come up. They weren't legible socially, especially, I guess, in the environment of Augusta, Georgia. I knew that that was something I wasn't supposed to be. Um, I did also absorb the danger 
of queerness. I mean, I remember vividly the news reports around uh, the death of Matthew Shepard, which was now 25 years ago. Um, And I remember that probably being the first time I absorbed the news talking about somebody being gay. Not a great, you know, we're not starting out great here in terms of the narratives. No, no. So that was it. You know, and then it wasn't really until I made it to my preteen years and I was privileged enough to get my mom's, one of my mom's hand-me-down computers because she taught typing. Um, And that was when I got connected to the internet. You know, the wilderness of the early 2000s internet. And I was in Yahoo chat rooms labeled LGBT. and, And so I realized, oh, there are other people like me out there. I just got to find them. They may not be here or I may not know them here, but they're somewhere. Yeah, I mean, you bring up such an important point. This is actually kind of where I was going to go next, which is that while you weren't finding community necessarily in your day-to-day life at school or in church, finding it on the internet was really impactful. And at the ACLU, we've been fighting against legislation like the Kids Online Safety Act, for example, which poses an, as an internet safety law. But in really, in reality, it would actually censor crucial affirming online content that queer youth really do benefit from, you know, given the kind of context that we're living in. And what do you make of the efforts that we see of people trying to censor it? I think that we have to figure out the balance between how we give young people the information that they need to navigate, you know, society safely and fully informed, which includes young people knowing that LGBTQ plus folks exist. Like, that is not actually the threat that people are saying it is. You know, that's not grooming. That is giving them information because as we see with the increasing numbers of openly queer identified Gen Zers, you know, those numbers are are only increasing because we have more understanding of, of these identities. So we've got to be educating young people on that and educating young people about healthcare. But go figure, you know, people don't want you to fully know about your body or be invested in body bodily autonomy because there are so many who want to restrict reproductive justice or access to abortion and gender affirming care and on and on. Yeah, we're so much easier to control, so much more receptive to fear when we have a lack of knowledge. Another formative means of community and self-exploration for you was drag. In the book, you write lovingly about your experience doing drag shows in college at the University of Georgia and a memorable night out at a drag performance with your older sister in New York. Much like online queer safe havens, drag is also under political attack. Mm-hmm. You know, these attacks are founded in homophobia, transphobia, clear misunderstanding of the art form. Can you talk about what participating in drag taught you or the significance that it has had in your life? Yeah. The moment you just mentioned where my sister took me to Lucky Chang's in New York and I saw like real drag performance for the first time. Um, It was Mm -hmm. so uh, beautiful to have my sister see me and, and legitimize queer culture for me in that way. She was the first person to ever do that in my life. Um, And then shortly after that, I would say my second semester of my freshman year, I had started to meet queer and trans people at the University of Georgia. And there was this drag show. And there's this one moment where this drag queen, who was also a student, was like, ah, you have a great face for drag. You have great bone structure. And I was like so caught off guard by it, but it it planted a seed that like, oh, well, maybe I should try this. But I I was afraid. I was like, oh, well, if I give in to this overtly feminine endeavor, I would completely be turning my back on these masculine standards, which I already didn't fit. Um, But, you know, I I made a bet with myself and 
I did it, you know, and it was such a fulfilling experience. It gave me an opportunity to play with gender in a way I wouldn't have had without that outlet for expression. And then it didn't take long, you know, a good year or so for me to realize, oh, this isn't so much a performance, this is actually me. And I started having revelations mm. of like, oh, well, if I could just dress this way all the time or be spoken to like this all the time or use this name or, and pronoun all the time, life would make so much more sense. You mentioned your sister taking you to this drag performance and how that was so meaningful to have someone so close to you really validate y this experience. I also wanted to talk about was how you talk about grief and family. You discuss grief and acceptance when it comes to loved ones, writing that you, quote, had to figure out how to hold on to your parents while carving out a place for your queerness to be fostered, and that your, quote, father's death was the jolt you needed to embrace your gender identity. Mm. It's really not easy to accept the people that you know, we love when their views involve a disapproval of who we are. Can you talk about how you learned to navigate this with your family? Yeah. Um, well, I think a few things. Even though my parents, like most parents in our society, were ill-equipped to raise a queer and trans kid, um, what they did instill in me was a sense of independence, a sense of critical thinking, um, not just accepting what somebody else says. Like, it, I mean, outside of religion, of course, you know, outside of these ideas of just believe. Um, they did encourage me to be an independent thinker. And when I came out to my father, because I came out to my mom about a year before, you know, everything hit the fan when I told them I wanted to come out at school. And some of that, in my opinion, was, of course, what they said was the fear of what that would mean for me to, mm. as they would say, declare this truth. Um, and I also knew some of it was like the shame Mm -hmm. of raising a queer and trans child because that was not an, a laudable thing to do. But I also was aware that it helped, It hurt a bit more when peers, as I got older, started to ask, really just in kind of like a curious way, if I was gay. And I would have to stutter and say, no, I felt like such a fraud. So... I kind of got to the space where I was like, I, I can't discard my parents and my family because the other thing that was always instilled in me was this idea that family is forever. Mm. Even if we don't always un, uh, agree or get along. And so I trusted my parents that that was true. And after the initial shock of me coming out to them, um, it they lived up to that creed, I guess. And so, you know, it, it never was like perfect before my father passed. He passed about five years after, really four years after I came out to him, because I was I was fifteen when I came out to him. He died when I was nineteen. Um. And he never fully understood or accepted my queerness. And I do deal with the worry or concern that maybe he never would have fully accepted it. And, and sure as hell probably would not have accepted my transness. But I try to give him grace that he would have been able to evolve. Well, to that end, you write a really important letter to your late father and describe the relief alongside your grief following his death. Because as you said, you wouldn't have to come out to him a second time as trans. 
I was wondering if you might be willing to read a portion of that letter for us. So this is the end of the letter. Your death saddened me, but it also freed me. I could love you and not fit your mold. I could love you and I didn't have to see myself as a failure for not being the epitome of black masculinity. I could love you and I didn't have to surrender my brief, precious life to your dreams. Sincerely, the child formerly known as your son. Yeah, I mean, wow, there's so much there. I think you're you're capturing this sense of freedom, I think, that exists amidst a, a huge loss. Um, was the sense of freedom immediate for you? How did that come to you? No, it was... I mean, I call it a a bit of a, I guess, a bittersweet freedom, but it was not immediate, um, that kind of release of his expectations. Um, I went through a period of several months where I stopped performing in drag. I was like, I did not want to uh, tarnish his legacy. There there was a big piece around tarnishing his Mm. legacy. And so if I continue to embrace my femininity, I would be doing that. And what would that mean? And there was also a piece of me that was like, oh, I don't want people to think that like, you know, for lack of a a smoother phrase, I jumped off the deep end when my father passed, right? Because there was also just a time when even more so than now, there was so much rhetoric around trans people being um, mentally ill in a way. Yeah. And so I was also contending with some of those ideas as well back in 2010, 2011. Raquel, that's a lot to piece (laughs) through. And I really appreciate your, like, vulnerability and willingness to share. I'm sure it's it's not easy. But, you know, the, the thing that strikes me is that so often we share stories that are kind of like formed. I think it speaks volumes to like your commitment to the people who come behind you, the young people who come next to be willing to share something so personal and something so helpful and thinking, okay, did anyone ever think these thoughts before? I just don't think we see those stories very often where people are like honest about the the challenge. I want to take a little bit of a pivot and talk about your career in journalism. You pursued journalism college and you write in the book about your dream of becoming a magazine editor one day. You gained your footing as a rural newspaper reporter where you worked, quote, stealth that is posited <laughs> as a queer trans woman. And eventually you achieved this dream, becoming an editor at Out Magazine. In your early days as a journalist, what was it like to trying to do like meaningful, inclusive work while largely hiding who you are in your workplace, especially when it likely informs a lot of the stories you want to tell? Yeah, I mean... It is like being a spy, you know? Um, And I guess just to give people more context, like when I started my journalism career, I graduated from the University of Georgia in 2013. It It was literally two months after that when Orange is the New Black premiered with Laverne Cox, which kind of sparked this trans visibility era that we often talk about. Totally. And that was the same week that the George Zimmerman trial verdict came down. So the ramp up of the movement for Black Lives, um, and as folks colloquially call it, Black Lives Matter, started, you know, bubbling in a different way. And so this was the start of kind of a new paradigm in a lot of ways for folks on the margins to kind of talk about our experiences. And being a Black trans Mm -hmm. woman, I was in the middle of both of those, right? 
So this was at the very start of my career. But I was in, you know, Monroe, Georgia, working at a newspaper where I wasn't out as queer or trans, and I was afraid that I would be found out and I would lose my job or experience some kind of violence. I mean, I would... I pushed the envelope as much as I could in my weekly columns. And I was always inserting my social justice lens in there. So it was it was a hard thing to take. So the, it was a difficult time because I knew that things were changing culturally. But in that context of being in small town Georgia, it was like not moving at the same pace. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And something that you that I think is pretty notable in your book is you express how much you love your home um, despite knowing that your freedom lied beyond the confines of Augusta, Georgia. You write that the more I immersed myself in the Black, queer, and trans community in Atlanta, the more I saw the South's radical transformative power. I think, you know, like I was mentioning, that the narrative is uh, about the South from people who write about it in the North, it gets a reputation of being behind, of not being progressive due to political history and present-day legislation, both. But I think it stifles us to render the South in this way. And I was wondering if you could speak more about the South's transformative power and, and how you've witnessed it as an activist on the ground in Georgia. There's just this kind of idea that, I don't know, that the South was um, not a main character or not a, a main contender. I mean, even thinking about how we learn about history, um, so much of the idea, particularly as someone descended from enslaved Africans, was that freedom lied in the North. And so I think that kind of idea seeps into every part of a Southern person's life, or it can, right? Mm -hmm. And I knew New York as I got older, and San Francisco were queer meccas, and so that only deepened the idea. Mm -hmm. You know, we weren't calling Atlanta the Black gay mecca yet, so, so that wasn't a part of the lore necessarily for me. So, I mean, I I, I grew up with that. And, and I think that that idea that the South is particularly regressive um, is perpetuated in media. I mean, yes, they're the deepest fights around voter suppression or abortion and reproductive justice or um, sexual education or trans rights, you name it. You know, it's, it's, it is usually Southern states leading those efforts. And yet, I think that we forget that so much of our understanding of social justice and so much of our methods um, around so social justice and social change come from fights that happen in the South. I mean, the civil rights. You don't get the lessons from the civil rights without the resistance and resilience of folks in the South. And so I, I think that we really need to be shifting out of this idea that certain regions are more regressive than others because it ignores that white supremacy is everywhere. Yes. It just looks different. We, it mm -hmm. ignores that the cis patriarchy is everywhere. It just looks different. You know, it's a bit more muted and more polite, if you will, in the North and in the, on the West Coast in these, what I call derisively progressive pearl areas. You know, and so even though I live in Brooklyn, New York now, I'm always invested in bursting that progressive pearl bubble. <laughs> I think you perfectly teed me up here, which is <laughs> to say that, you know, when you say that white supremacy exists everywhere and exists even in the most progressive social justice movements, you write that I, quote, I developed a healthy skepticism of institutions. Everyone claimed to be trying to save somebody like me, but their words and actions consistently showed me otherwise. So to challenge this and call everyone into the project of liberation, 
in the mecca of progressive activism, you organized the rally in March for Black Trans Lives at the Brooklyn Museum in 2020. I believe in my power. I believe in my power. I believe in your power. I believe in your power. I believe in our power. I believe in our power. I believe in black trans power. Y'all gonna say it with me again? It's rare that we see major movements that operate with such a specific call to action. What were some of your big takeaways from this event? I will say (laughs) that, at the very least for me, it felt like a historic moment. Um, Mm -hmm. It felt like a paradigm was shifting, you know, of course, with the murder of George Floyd, I think so many folks were rethinking how white supremacy continues to operate in our society. And I think we were connecting on a different level collectively. There was more support and understanding for the efforts of grassroots organizers. Um... And I think that day showed me that, you know, these big moments are necessary. And I think it's necessary for us to figure out how to sustain momentum. And I think that that is where we find ourselves again, right? As we get ready for another presidential election year in particular, where we're going to have to make some real choices around how much we're going to compromise. I think that's kind of the takeaway for me is that we've got to be paying attention to these cycles. We've got to be more on the offense, especially those of us who are invested in collective liberation, than being on the defense, which we often find ourselves in. Yeah, this is one of my stump speeches, Raquel. I always (laughs) say um, on the podcast that we... We actually are so invested in being on the defense that we forget that we can we can actually go to our school boards and affirmatively fight for more LGBTQ plus books in our kids' school libraries. One thing I wanted to pick up on was I think one of the political messages that is sent to queer and trans people is this message that, oh, you don't you don't actually know yourself. It seemed that despite regular insistence from others that you didn't know yourself for much of your life, you actually knew who you were from a very, very young age. So I'm sure that there are many people listening who are grappling with this. And I wonder, what is your advice to queer or trans youth who are experiencing this nationwide denial of their self-determination? Oh, it sounds so simple, but I do think that there is merit in trusting your inner voice. Um, even if you have to hold it within yourself for survival for a certain amount of time. I think that is it is important to own that voice. I think finding media that reflects you or is closer to your experience can be so enriching, whether it is communities online or it's books. That may be banned, but, you know, just like I had to do, honey, you sneak. You know, I remember when I was in high school, I would go to Barnes & Noble and I wanted, like, queer fiction books. And I would always get that and maybe, like, a bland magazine so I could hide it, you know, as Mm. I was, like, walking out or into the the house. Finding community is necessary. If you got to look up for a community group that is a queer and trans oriented one and sneak to it, do that. You know, your survival is necessary. Um, And you may have to get a bit creative uh, to create the environment that you deserve, Um, but, but you deserve it. The other thing I will say is just know that there were folks who came before you who probably had it harder in some ways, but they still found a way to live their truths and you can do it too. Um, And also that you are an example. You are a bridge between those folks who came before you and the ones that are inevitably coming after you. Mm, I love that. Thank you so much for that, Raquel. 
As we wrap up here today, I'm wondering if you would treat us with one more excerpt from your book. Revolution isn't a singular event, but a continuously unfolding phenomenon. The transformational energy we feel during seismic events doesn't dissipate. It stays with us, waiting to be activated so we can transform the institutions around us. The collectives, the industries, the organizations, the schools, the places of worship, our communities, our families, and ourselves. So let everything you feel be fertilizer. Anguish, anxiety, fear, grief, joy, love, mourning, rage, sorrow, wanting, yearning. And let us not be distracted or deterred from our duties in the Garden of Liberation, honoring our place, taking the risk to bloom again and again, planting seeds of resilience, and leaving the soil richer for generations to come. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts and rate and review the show. We really appreciate the feedback. Until next week, stay strong. At Liberty is a production of the ACLU, produced by me, Kendall Seesmeyer, and Vanessa Handy. This episode was edited by Matt Boynton. Julian Silva-Forbes is our intern. <laughs>